Good morning. And grace and peace to you all and welcome to worship this morning at Howard Memorial. Our guest minister today is Rob Evans, whom I introduced last week. A short bio of Rob is included on the last page of today's bulletin in the announcement uh, portion. Uh, Rob will be preaching also in August uh, four consecutive weeks uh, where he'll continue his uh, evaluation of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I failed last Sunday to introduce Rob's wife, Lavinia. She's with us again today, seated up front with Lily and some mutual friends, Martha and George Cady. A uh, little trivia, George and Rob and I were fraternity brothers at NC State. Uh, also under announcements today, uh, today will be our first lemonade on the lawn served out front by the children of the church immediately after our morning worship service. Rob, welcome back. Again, it's great to be in worship with you today and a part of this congregation. I look forward to being back in August for four more Sundays. I do hope uh, that your pastor's sabbatical leave is going well. Uh, I'd like to say as a retired pastor, uh, having uh, served uh, numerous congregations for 35 years actively, uh, it's quite a gift 
I was blessed to have had one leave, and it, it meant a lot to Lavinia and me and our, our work in ministry just to step away and become renewed and refreshed. And I think you will find uh, Ben to be uh, uh, to benefited by this gift. So uh, thinking about him and his family during this time. Let us be called to worship together. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And as we share in the prayer of the day, the Lord is with you. Let us pray. You have called us, O God, to be your people. You have loved us and chosen us for your own. Clothe us with your compassion, your kindness, your humility, your gentleness, and your patience. Help us to forgive one another as you have forgiven us. And bind us all together in the perfect unity of love. We pray in the name of Jesus, our friend and our redeemer. Amen. Sisters and brothers, before God and one another, with humility and sincerity, 
let us confess our sin and our frailty. Let us pray together, observing a time for silent prayer afterward. Gracious God, we confess that all too often our hearts are divided and our true worship rests in the false gods and countless idols of this world. We have fixed our eyes upon the things that dazzle and delight us, and in turn we have been misled time and again. Forgive us, we pray. Lift our eyes above the mundane and the trivial, that we might see your goodness and live in light of Christ our Savior. Hear us now in a time of sacred silence as we confess our individual sins to you. Friends, the Apostle John wrote in his letter, In this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is the good news of the gospel, and I declare unto you, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, and we are bold to sing God's praise. pray. Empty us, great God, of all that prevents us from hearing what you want us to hear. Empty us of our preconceptions, our preoccupations, and our prejudices. Empty us that we might be filled with your spirit and the presence of Christ. Empty us that we might be filled for ministry and mission. We pray in your strong and holy name. Amen. From the Old and New Testaments this morning, first from the reading, a reading from Leviticus. If any of you have ever taken up the challenge of reading through the Bible, I've tried that a few times and, and I'll be honest, never, never really done it well because by the time I got to Leviticus, I just said, give me a psalm or, or give me the book of John or get me to something that Jesus said because Leviticus kind of wore me out. But uh, the value of reading through is there's, there's usually some really good stuff. And Leviticus 19 is a chapter in Leviticus which I think speaks to us well and has a lot to do with Jesus, the teaching in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. So let us listen for God's word. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for the Lord your God is holy. You shall teach them to revere your mother and father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or cast images for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. 
basically the Ten Commandments in Leviticus, which is also in Deuteronomy. They're just in a little different setting. Picking up with the 11th verse, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of the, of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor. You shall not steal. You shall not keep for yourselves the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear the Lord, because I am the Lord. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, and you will incur guilt upon yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then in the New Testament from the letter of Peter, and you will see the connection between these two texts. Peter is writing to the early church from the first chapter beginning with the 13th verse. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be yourselves holy in your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And then from the second chapter of the same letter, beginning with the fourth verse. Come to him a living stone. Though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Sorry. 
vibration of your eyes and think about what faith feels like. I must say that I love that hymn. It's always been one of my favorites, and I used to remind my congregations that it was written by a Presbyterian minister. And lo and behold, last Sunday they showed me to the room over there to the side, and uh, Dan Iverson was your pastor from 1922 to 26. It's just, it's such a small world, and uh, how things sometimes just fit together. So. Uh, Glad you sing it weekly, and it's such a beautiful hymn, and uh, the connection is uh, remarkable. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, for those of you who weren't here last Sunday, I told the congregation a, a story that I had heard years ago of a little boy uh, upon being at Sunday school one Sunday on his way home, told his mother that he had learned God's first name. And she was intrigued and she said, well, what is it? And he said, well, it's right there in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, Harold be thy name. So if you were here, thanks for listening twice. But it, it does have a point of telling it again. Because years ago, I, I did tell this story <laughs> to one of my congregations. Uh, I don't know whether that story is true, but this story is true. So I was greeted at the door by a member of the congregation with an even better story. 
You know, she said, I have an older brother named Harold, and when we were growing up and learning the Lord's Prayer, we got things more than just a little confused. So she went on and described, one night she said she was going to bed and, and I drifted by my brother's bedroom and overheard him beginning to pray, our Father who art in heaven and Harold would be my name. Well, that got confusing and she said, because I heard my brother, pl my brother pl praying this way, I figured it was only my duty to introduce myself to God. So I, then I began to pray, our Father who art in heaven, and Wilma would be my name. <laughs> so I just love children because they, they pay attention, but the things we take for granted and the vocabulary of our faith, they don't always connect like they connect with us. And so it, it just keeps us on our toes and it reminds us that God has a sense of humor. But back to our focus on the prayer Jesus taught. When you pray, said Jesus, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This actually is the first whole petition of the prayer. Then there are five others. We'll, we'll talk about those in weeks to come. But we, we, we mentioned last week in this first petition, two parts, God has a name. And the name Jesus gave God was Abba in Aramaic, which translates, of course, as Father, or more intimately, it could be translated, as you know, as Daddy. And if a father image is troublesome for you, you can always substitute Mother or the Aramaic Emma, I-M-M-A. But the idea is that God, as Jesus teaches, is the loving parent of all, which makes God accessible and approachable because God wants to come, us to come to him as any child would come to a father or a mother. God knows our needs before we ask. And just as a good parent desires good, good things to give to their children in a much greater way, so in, in a much greater way, it's a hyperbole, God desires to give good things to his own. And the second part of the early petition is that God has an address. God's address is in heaven. And we, we mentioned that heaven describes the transcendence of God, that God is greater. God can't be fully known and, and described. God is transcendent, but heaven also means that God has come near. Heaven is at hand, Jesus taught. The kingdom of God has entered into your time and space, and as so many of the parables illustrated, the kingdom of heaven is like, and there are just so many parables that are, use earthly imagery to describe how God's kingdom comes close to us. So today we finish that first petition with the emphasis on hallowed be thy name. What does it mean to hallow the name of God? Well, first off, the, the word hallow is really not in our vernacular. It's a bit awkward and strange and it's, it's definitely not southern talk, is it? But it's the biblical word which refers to the holiness of God. God's otherness, God's being set apart from humanity and humankind. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are in effect saying that God is different. God is far greater than anything we can conceive. And the minute we try to box in God, you see, and contain God, we have already committed idolatry. Because God cannot be fixated and controlled. God is always greater than anything we can ever conceive. Yes, God deserves praise and thanksgiving, but also our utmost reverence and respect. Or as our Jewish friends are quick to tell us, when we come before God, we are to remember that God is God and we are not, period. 
Now, I think there's an emotion or an experience that describes the holiness of God, and it would be awe. I think the word awe illustrates. When we hallow someone or something, we are in awe of them. Sometimes we're rendered speechless. Often we're just sort of taken aback. We, we know in inexplicable ways that we're on holy ground, holy moments. So to use the words of the contemporary hymn, our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven and above in wisdom, in power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Now how does this sense of awe and wonder at the holiness of God become internalized and practiced not just in the words we say in a prayer but in our human experience? Well, I think it plays out, first of all, universally in all peoples, in all cultures. Even if the name of God by which they call the Holy One is not the, the, the same name we say. But this is the, from the beginning of creation, I believe, in all peoples because God made us this way to have relationship with God's self. There's all kinds of universal evidence among ancient peoples of altars and sanctuaries and holy sites where people marked their experience of the holy. They, they made a place that have, has lasted for thousands of years where they engaged with a presence that was beyond themselves. The Mayan culture, the Native American Indian culture, the great stone monoliths of Ireland and Great Britain and France. Many of you have seen these. The markers all over the world of indigenous peoples who have experienced the holy. So the capacity to experience the holy is innate in every human being. It, it's not just reserved for Christians. It's innate in every person. Several years ago, our, our uh, oldest grandchild is almost seven, it will be seven this fall, but he was in a preschool program at Edenton Street United Methodist Church in Raleigh. It's, it's kind of the cathedral-like Methodist Church in downtown Raleigh. It's a wonderful preschool, but th they obviously took the children into the sanctuary and they had chapel and different things. So one day after Lavinia and I picked Sully up from preschool, he said, Papa, I want to go into the big church. And so I, I held him and we walked up and down and, and he became still and quiet and then began to, to point at a certain stained glass window and, and he said very quietly, Papa, this is God. This is God here. And of course, you know, his preacher granddaddy was just like, wow, you know. It's amazing. Let the children come unto me, said Jesus, for such as these is the kingdom of heaven. So think of your own experiences. Haven't there been occasions when you have experienced the awesomeness of God? I think of the, the hymn we often sing during Holy Week and Easter, Were You There? Sometimes when we think of the cross and even the resurrection, it causes me to tremble, to tremble. Our African-American brothers and sisters knew it, knew that experience. Or have you ever felt something of the unapproachableness of God? Do not come near, said the voice of God to Moses at the burning bush. Put off your shoes for the place on which you stand is holy ground. Don't come too near. See, we really can't stand being too close to God. The holiness will always get us. 
Where have you stumbled upon holy ground in your life? A sacred spot, a sacred presence, your life touched. Remember Michelangelo's wonderful illustration at the Sistine. The Creator's hand and our hands touching. Or what about something of the greatness and the power of God? The feeling of God is so great and, and I'm so small before the presence of the living God. Abraham said in Genesis, Behold, I've taken upon myself to speak to the Lord, but I am but dust and ashes. He knew in the presence of the holy God who he was. So have you felt at times the very creaturelessness before God, your creaturelessness? Of course, uh, one of the great stories in the scriptures is the call of Isaiah when he's just worshiping on an ordinary day at the temple and, and the glory of the Lord appears to him and, and Isaiah falls before in a, in a prostrate way. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory for mine eyes have seen the king. And then immediately... Upon experiencing the presence of the Holy, what does Isaiah do? He says, woe is me, for I dwell in the land of a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. So, have you ever felt just plain undone? That's the language that King James uses. Isaiah said, I became undone. Forty-four years since my ordination... Do you think I remotely feel qualified to speak of God all these many years? That I have or any preacher has some hotline to heaven? That I am worthy to even say a word on God's behalf? I can tell you that there are times and times still that I feel completely undone and incapable of speaking a word about God. Who am I? Yes, woe is me. So many ways we can think of the holy. God's, the energy of God and the urgency of God sometimes breaks in to the human experience. There's so many stories where of people where this has happened. It doesn't happen to everyone. Not everybody has a blinding light kind of thing, a burning bush kind of thing. We shouldn't put ourselves up above anybody if we've had certain things or if we don't have, then we're less. But some of you know the wonderful story of Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician and philosopher. He carried a little scrap of paper around with him his entire life, which was the record of his encounter with the holiness of God. And it was found sewn into his coat upon his death this paper that he carried. And this is what it says. In the year of grace, 1654, on Monday the 23rd of November, from about half past 10 in the evening until about half past 12, fire! God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not God of the philosophers and the scholars. Certitude joy, peace. That's how he wrote down his experience with the holy. Or even the mystery of God. Not just those things about which God you don't understand or maybe could if we put a little more intentionality into our study, etc. We could all use a little more of that. But the sense that God comes to you from the outside, outside of all your power, outside of all your ability to reason. If you want to reason your way to God, you're never going to get there. We are to love God with our minds. Surely we are. But we're not going to get there by reason alone. It's not going to happen. Katie had the point this morning about faith. Outside our common abilities to comprehend, 
and any human initiative, God comes. So that means that God can be alien and strange, foreign to anything else we've ever experienced. So perhaps we've been dumbstruck a time or two in our own lives. I think about in the life of the church that the two greatest events maybe that hold us most, the birth of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And I remember those stories. On the night of Jesus' birth, the angel of the Lord came to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And did the shepherds first say, well, this is wonderful. Uh, let's have a little dance about this is so great. No. They were sore afraid, says the King James. The NRSV, they were terrified that God had come in this mysterious way. And we move to Easter. Remember the women at the empty tomb that first Easter morn. Mark tells us that rather shouting hallelujah, Christ is risen. Mark tells us they fled for fear and trembling had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone. And that's the way the, the gospel of Mark ends right there. In fear and in amazement. Not in hallelujahs. Hallowed be thy name. That's something that doesn't even really get all of it by any stretch. Something of the meaning. Now I, I believe that we not only encounter God's holiness from our experience in a myriad of ways. But we can also teach it. And we can model it. We do that by the way we worship, whether it be traditional worship or more contemporary worship. The church ought not to be having these worship wars. They're just divisive. But certainly worship that always honors God, not worship that is intentionally full of hype to have entertainment in order to draw people. That's, that's what you see a lot in what we call the mega churches. It's, it's worshipainment, if you will. In my ministry, I had a midlife crisis, which my wife will attest to. It wasn't another woman. It was the church. But I, I just I felt called to leave a traditional established church in a town just like Tarboro, North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, where our son grew up, where Lowe's was the, the headquarters of the day. It was, a, it was a wonderful place to raise a child and a family. But after 12 years, I felt called to develop a new congregation from scratch, nothing but a field and an old agricultural building that the presbytery said, well, y'all can convert this old agricultural building into your sanctuary. Well, we did. But it didn't look like a church. And it didn't feel like a church. We didn't have an organ. All we could get was a piano and hopefully a few people to start worshiping with us. And somehow over time, by a miracle, it happened. And, and, and God sent... One woman, we advertised for a musician, and one woman applied, and she got the job. And she was wonderful, and she helped us, wasn't always in Presbyterian ways, to worship in a way that honored God. So, how we worship. I love your liturgy, by the way. I really like it a lot. Another way we teach it, and I've seen it, and it might be subtle, and it's here in your church, is by observing silence. Silence, it has been said, is the very language of God. And we are mistaken when we describe prayer as talking to God. Prayer is also as much, or if not more, listening to God. And we can only listen to God in stillness, be still. And know that I am the Lord. The Hebrew, by the way, can be translated as shut up. Literally. And know that I am God. 
And, and, and stillness, until we get used to practicing it, makes us nervous. We start rattling paper and squirming. But, but over time, sometimes that is how we commune with God. Our Quaker friends have a lot to teach us, by the way. If you've never been to a silent Quaker meeting, go. They, they talk about centering down so that we might listen and hear God. And in their tradition, no one speaks until they hear something out of the stillness. It's a wonderful tradition. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. How God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. Phillips Brooks. A little town of Bethlehem. There are other ways. I remember a faithful elder Betty in one of my churches who was the worship committee chair and she always included children especially in the preparation of communion and she taught them about the elements and then we allowed on communion Sundays for the children to bring in the elements and place them on the table and it became a very sacred time in the life of the church. But, but children were learning something of the sacred just by doing this, just by doing it. Reverence can be taught by doing. So the holiness of God, my friends, is, is, is the nature of God's character. And it's God's holiness that always evokes our reverence and response in worship. But we would be remiss if it didn't do something else. Because we worship not only with our lips, but with our lives. The awesome wonder of God is not just a feeling in the sanctuary or on a mountaintop. It's reflected in our actions. And this is what is behind Leviticus. Because God is holy, we are to be holy in our actions. That, the outgrowth of the Ten Commandments in Leviticus is, is all out of that. We, we obey God. We want to obey God because God is holy. And if we read on, it's not just the do nots. It's being holy means caring for the widow and the stranger and the poor and the aged. And can you believe in Leviticus, the second half of the great commandment of Jesus comes from there. Love your neighbor as yourself, right out of the 19th chapter. And this is what holy is being all about for Peter in his writing to the early church. They will remember that once they were no people, but they had become, by grace, God's people. Once they had not received mercy, but they had now received mercy. In the King James, the word for God's people is God's peculiar people. Holiness means we carry a certain peculiarity about us. We're not just to blend in with everything and everybody. So when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are petitioning that God's ethical wholeness be demonstrated in us by our ethical behavior. Because God is peculiar and different, so are we. Now how does this happen, briefly? Well, it doesn't happen by being holier than thou. That is self-righteousness to the utmost, the, the holier than thou person. If you're aware that you're holy, you're not. But the ability, my friends, lies not in ourselves, but always outside ourselves, in the fellowship which we either have or do not have with God. In other words, we cannot be holy people by deciding to be holy. Holiness is always a grace given. It's a gift of God. It comes out of God's nature as a gift to us. And it's always a byproduct of our fellowship with God and God's people. So much in this wonderful prayer of our Lord. We call upon our Abba Father 
our parent, our eternal parent, whose presence is both beyond us and near us, and whose presence and whose character is holy and sacred. And in calling upon God our Father, we are also asking God to help us to be holy as God is holy, to mold and shape us more into his image. And I think we would all agree that this is something we need. Knowing this, let us share the prayer of our Lord together. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
I, I want to be correct. Do you say in the creed the Holy Spirit? Are you saying Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit? You're using ghost. Okay. Just want to be, that's the way I learned it. Just want to be correct of. Thank you. Let us be joined in prayer once again. Holy God, giver of life and love and mercy, giver of yourself in Jesus Christ our Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this holy place and this holy time as your people. Holy moments before you in the fellowship of your church. Oh God, we bring to you our very selves as we pray. Our often divided and confused selves. But you accept us as we are and we thank you. We bring our needs. We bring our hurts, our disappointments. We bring the pain we know and the pain that nobody knows but you. We bring the pain of the world. We think of the people in Florida dealing with a, a tragedy beyond comprehension and understanding. We lift those grieving people up to you this day. We bring to you our many joys also, the many things in this life that give us delight and happiness and all that is good. And we say thank you because we understand that every good and perfect gift comes from your hand. Oh God, be with us now in a, in a time of silence. Hear our most private and sincere prayers. But in the silence, may we discern what you would have to say to us. And if we don't receive it in moments of silence, help us to continue to practice silence that we might listen to you speak. So hear us in silence, we pray. And now take us, holy God, take us as we are. Use us as instruments of your peace, as those who reflect the light and love of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. I, just as a reminder, I know you're already in the habit of this, but most of you have gotten used to uh, giving offering online perhaps, or mailing in your offering, uh, but you also are encouraged if, if you want to make an offering to leave it in the, uh, is it a box or something in the back? Uh, a plate. You'll see it as you leave the door. Uh, encourage you to, to give as God has so given unto us in, in the myriad of ways in which you can do that through the life of this church. So let us worship God with our offering. The Lord is with you. Let us pray. Lord, how can we remember all your creation in this offering? You have given us time and the seasons. You have given us families and friends. You have given us our family of the church. Accept our offering of these, the works of our hands and the fruits of our labors. Accept these things as offerings of our love. We pray in the name of Jesus, whose grace and love have been lavished upon us. Amen.
thank Bill for uh, helping with the hymns, selecting them. I'm still familiarizing myself. The, the hymnal is not totally new, but I'm still familiarizing myself. And Bill, you do a wonderful job with the music and picking hymns and choir. Thank you, too, for today. Appreciate it. Friends, go in peace, renewed in the purposes of God. Always remember, in the goodness of God you were born. In the love of God you were redeemed. And in the providence of God, you are kept this day and forevermore. Get it right. Get it, get it, get it right. <laughs> I'll take close, man. Close is good in horseshoe. <laughs> there you go.